Ja, okay, ich werde die auch mal. Oh, okay. Das white people join now. People are slowly joining. Yep. For those who have joined, just um, wait for a few others to join in the next few seconds and they'll get underway. It looks like we're plateaued now. So welcome everybody. Welcome to this webinar, um, a joint session between Hazans and New Zealand Occupation um, Hygiene Society. So welcome. Um, today we're talking about workplace hygiene management and some of the key areas are ventilation, cleaning, control, PPE, and driving to work, So, and plus a few other things that they'll bring in. And we've got uh, myself as Philip Aldridge uh, from the Health and Safety Association of New Zealand, so welcome. So today, to thank you for the format, so today we'll just do a bit of an overview and introduce the panellists, and then we'll have a, a presentation about 20 minutes from Derek, and then we'll have some Q&A. So everyone who's attending will be on mute and the video off. And so I encourage you to have your questions. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. So I encourage you to put your questions in there and we'll endeavor to answer those throughout the next hour or so. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, yes, so I encourage you to ask questions and we'll go from there. The, the, the presentation and the recording, so we are recording today, and the presentation will be available on the Hazian site uh, within the next few hours. So if you don't need to take notes, so be on the COVID-19 section on our website. And you'll also see some other resources and also the, um, sorry, there's a question coming in, sorry. Um, also see other previous webinars we've run, we've done about three or four over the last while. So I encourage you to look at those as well. So um, to the panelists, can you introduce yourself, where you're from and what's your role? Perhaps start with Bridget. Hi, um, my name is Bridget Jennings. I'm the Managing Director and Senior, that's my dog, um, Senior Occupational Hygiene um, Hygienist at Chem Safety Limited. And I'm also a counsellor on the um, NZOHS. Derek. Hi, I'm uh, Derek Miller. I'm an Occupational Hygienist, an uh, independent consultant, and I'm a fellow of the New Zealand Occupational Society. Carl. Um, afternoon, I'm Carl Goodhue, work for a consultancy, Occupational um, Hygiene Consultancy, Air Matters, and um, I'm based out of Mount Wanganui, and we've got, also got a site in Auckland. Brad? Hi, my name is uh, Farai Chagonda. I'm an independent ventilation specialist, specialising with tunnels and mines. Um, currently working on the CRL3 project. Uh, and I'm based in Hamilton, but I basically work throughout uh, New Zealand, South Island, oh, nice. Island. Thank you. So, uh, Derek, do you want to pop up the screen? Bring up presentation. Okay, we'll put ourselves on. on. Over to you, Derek. Derek, I don't think we can hear you. Right. Can you hear me now? Yep, perfect. Sweet. It's a, just, uh, just talking about the uh, things you need to consider to return to work safely. At level three, number comes back. As we go through levels two and zero, there are things you'll need to think about. COVID-19 is going to be around for a while by the looks of it. In advance, how do we want to look at that? And also for those who are going back into the workplace at the level two. Derek, you're breaking up a bit, mate. Particularly as more people start to travel. So what? So. Part one, 
lifespan. This is work that's been done by the New England Journal of Medicine. And they have looked at how long the survivors stay on surfaces and be active. As you can see, we range from anywhere from three hours for things like paper and tissue paper, all the way through to seven days on the outside of a surgical mask. This will help you determine this type of information, how often you need to clean, sanitize, etc. As one of the reasons we say if it's heavily touched, you should be cleaning, sanitizing. There's still work going on in this area around the airborne aspect. Originally, as you'll be aware, it was three hours. Seven. Now the talking that it can stay in the air for up to twelve hours. It's been done in laboratories and there is what going on in the just to try and bring up. As we go through the next few months, you'll see this information constantly updating as more people search. It gets peer reviewed, confirmed, and, and Derek, Derek, fill up here again. Um, you seem to be breaking up a bit, sort of sometimes pretty clear, sometimes a bit um, not quite coming through very well. Okay, how about that? Yeah, we'll keep going, then we may have to go to plan B. Okay. Just be the numbers that are online at the moment, because on heavy traffic. Can you hear me fine? Yep, at the moment, yep, sounds good. Yep, so as things go on, you'll find that there's COVID-19 information, things that we need to action or think about will change. And that is as we come to understand it, we understand how it moves in the air. Lost you, Derek. Derek, Derek, Derek. Earth coin, Derek. We lost you. That last bit. Can I speak again? <laughs> Hi, Philip. That's better, yep. No good. No good. Do you want to change your mobile device or maybe take your take your take your headphones off something maybe? Sorry, sorry, uh Kendies. Try that. Right. Let's get up. Okay. Speak to you and build maintenance people. One of the problems we get is a lot of people recycle air to save money. So they put it on something like 78% recycle. It keeps costs down. However, for this type of thing, we want fresh air. There's been work done in China, and some of the infections they've got is from places like restaurants, canteens, etc., where the ventilation system has been put onto recycle or the airflow is not good within the area and people table one or two tables away have been infected and they reckon that is the way it's just moving through the air so as i say this keeps going so one of the ways you can deal with it is to increase your ventilation rates bring in more fresh air from the outside have a higher percentage it's also important for those who don't have a ventilation system that air the place on a regular basis, i.e. open the windows. It's an old system, it's magical. But within your toilets, you should have some form of ventilation, hopefully. If so, put them on, keep them on 24-7. Encourage people to keep the lid down, because we know it has been picked up in the uh, human waste. And ideally, don't open the windows in the toilets, unless that's all you've got, because if the wind blows in, it's just going to blow back into the building if there was something around. So speak to your maintenance people. Think how are you going to manage the air in the building. The other thing is with your maintenance, if you've got a dry ventilation system, you don't need to get it a disinfected and cleaned. As you saw from that first slide, it should be, it'll be, won't be active. It won't be there. 
So, but if you've got a wet system, i.e. with water, uh, so a true air conditioning, then have you got any stagnant water in that system? If so, it needs to be cleaned out, it needs to be serviced, and this is because there's actually a uh, risk that Legionella could have been growing in it while we have been away. And with the lockdown period, that's been long enough for Legionella to start on. Also, with your general water systems, again, get it checked, particularly by your maintenance group. And for hotels and these type of places, or where you have shower rooms for people to change after work, if you've got dirty work going on, make sure your shower heads are cleaned, they're disinfected, so you can use a hypochlorite, a sodium hypochlorite or heavy bleach solution for that type of one. Because again, you can get build up of things like Legionella in there. For those that don't know, signs and symptoms of Legionella is a flu-like illness, dry cough, can lead to pneumonia. So it sounds very much like COVID, but it is different. So it's important that we don't mix these up, but you get the checks done before you reopen. Many of you will already have those checks in places, but I say just please remember that at the start. Cleaning. Because a lot of buildings have been locked down, all the dust that's been in the air naturally, including air pollution, will have settled down. About 80% of dust in a building is actually from the skin, this old uh, dead skin cells. And that will settle down so the place will look dirty. This is where we need to just basically clean. For the cleaning, it is straightforward. Detergent and water will get rid of that type of dust if it's lying around. Then you can use a bleach or a sanitizer and bleach is basically disinfectant. When you do use these, you've got to make sure you've got good ventilation. They are hazardous substances, so make sure you have the right gloves, etc., for working with it. And one of the areas is follow the manufacturer's instructions. Reason for this is quite simple. Some products, if you're using a disinfectant, normally they take need a contact time of 10 to 30 minutes. A sanitizer can be anywhere from about 15 seconds through to about 10 minutes. So depending on what you are using, as to how long it needs to be in contact with the surface. So, but do not think that you can double the dose and it will half the time. It doesn't work that way. And you have to keep that contact time, it's very important. Because if you go under that contact time, then if there is things there that is active, they can eventually become immune to that particular one, any dirt substance. And we've seen this with pesticides and others, and even medicines, like antibiotics, etc., where they haven't been used correctly. A, a handy way of cleaning surfaces, and you've seen this in the retail industry, when you've been down in supermarkets, etc., during lockdown, is disposable wipes. A very commonly used item, and most of them are sanitizers. And again, contact time a, from putting on to taking off a, is there. But as I say, please, please, when you're using bleachers, etc., make sure your ventilation is working. Uh, particularly if you're going to be using quite a bit of it. These are hazardous substances. You all know this, the hierarchy of control. It's important we do not forget it. We're hearing about PPE all the time, but there are other ways of dealing. Good ventilation, ideally elimination. I uh, got this chart here, that's adapted from NIOSH by the, uh, some of the journals. It's not a bad one. Substitution, well, we can't really substitute it. Engineering controls, highly valuable. Where you have them in workplaces and the work in, use them. Make sure they are working correctly. Barriers, you will see these coming in more and more. Even restaurants now are starting to put them up between a diners. We've seen that happening in China. And for your distance, and the panel be able to provide more around this. 
try and keep this distance, physical distance between each other. It's not a social distance, it's a physical distance. Ideally two meters. A, if you're in a controlled environment, then you're looking at about one, one and a half meters, ideally. If you've got to work closer than that, you need good systems in place. And I'm sure the panel will speak a bit more to that later. Shift work. A, a number of companies are working this way. So they've got half the workforce in on day one, two, three, and then the other half in on days four and five, and the following week they swap round. That way they maintain a bubble. They've got the same people there. So if something happens and they do have an outbreak, then they only lose half the workforce. And it's the same group all the time, so not interchanging people. Not always practicable, particularly for those who deal with customers face-to-face. Uh, -face. Thinking here of the like Kiwi Rail, uh, the shops, etc. So you've got to find a way around it. And PPE is always a last resort. And I'll come back into that in a bit more detail. What I want to cover is also is traveling to work. And this morning I was out on the, uh, I had to go out to site and we had to fit, fill in the forms and say, did we travel with somebody else? We we're in separate vehicles, public transport, etc. because it's good. So follow any company policy, make sure people know what you should be doing. And what the first rule is, if you have a cold, you've got the flu, anything like that, or somebody else at home is unwell, you must have the policy in place that somebody knows just to phone up and say, look, I need to speak to you. A, I've got this, and then you know that a person won't be coming in. It is important. As we go down the levels, it will still be important. Separate vehicles, as you know, but shared vehicles, some companies will use minibuses to pick people up. One way is to do more runs, so you've got less people in it. That way you can keep uh, your distance. One important thing with vehicles, in particularly shared vehicles, is do not recycle the air. So don't put it on the internal. Keep it on an external air intake. So you're bringing fresh air in from outside, it goes through the vehicle, and back out. So don't worry about cracking the windows open at the back. A, in public transport is going to be a challenge, try and maintain distance. Some people are advocating for a mask on nose, a, some aren't. So we'll, again, the panel can discuss that in more detail for you. <coughs> right, PPE an area we're getting lots of questions on, lots of discussions going about. First point, from a hygienist, occupational hygienist point of view, our surgical masks are not PPE. They, from research that have been done since about 2001 on the subject, a, we think they're good for about 20 to 30% of a droplets and of the larger droplets. You can always see gaps around them. And you will see a lot of people walking around, or you see them on the TV, where they've got them over the mouth, but not the nose. They need to cover both. And as you saw in that very first slide, a, where we do have something like COVID, COVID on it, it's lasting up to seven days on the outside. So people know, need to know how to put those on, take them off. Now, some people will want to wear them, and it's a reassurance thing, because they are worried about this COVID or maybe infecting or affecting others. So please make sure people know how to handle them, take them off, dispose of them, etc. For those who are going to wear PPE in a normal workplace, a, from the COVID point of view, it's normally P2, N95 or equivalent. It's a, fight, it's a tight fitting face piece, therefore it must be fit tested. You shouldn't need these things. If people are not infected, maintaining the social distance, these are not normally required. Maybe if you're doing face-to-face, -face, something to think about. Where you've already got these in your workplace, continue using them a, for the jobs they are designed for. If you're using a half-mask respirator, the or nasal, or another, 
there or a full face, continue using those. People need to be trained in putting them on, taking them off, and they need to be stored and serviced correctly. I saw uh, one on the news last night and somebody had it with them and they had it face down on the work surface. So if somebody was infected around them, coughing and sneezing, they've landed inside, inside the mask, they then put it on to protect themselves and they've got a nice hefty dose. You should already have these policies in place. If you don't, get them up and running. They'll blow the dust off them and check they still work. And if you need advice, a company, the hygienists, we do this regular and we can help. There's also other sites you can get good information on, such as 3M. Coveralls, you shouldn't need to wear coveralls. It's unless you are in the health a sector, but you do need to know how to put them on and take them off. It's a, a, even if you are wearing them as normal part of your normal job. Gloves, again, shouldn't need them if you keep maintaining good personal hygiene. But if people are wearing them, make sure they know how to put them on, make sure they know how to take them off. And on high touch areas, a lot of people will wear. And what we tend to see is people put gloves on, but they don't know how to take them off correctly. And when we actually do some testing around it, you can actually see the spread. And we use the fluorescent dye to do that. And you can actually see people spreading it all over the place. So there are posters out there, there's information there showing people how to take gloves off correctly. Last point on PPE. Check your PPE is still suitable. Those who continually to use it, make sure your supply lines are secure. If you have to get a new supply line in, be wary. There are a lot of counterfeit items out there in the marketplace at the moment that will not pass any testing and standards. Uh, I've dealt with a few already. These are coming in to make up the shortfall. They're not up to standards. So do your check and speak to your suppliers, get certification in. If in doubt, ask A for help. That's it, just be very, very careful. You, a, there are some good sites, CDC has a good site on counterfeit masks. There's information on 3M and a, other sites a, are putting up information around counterfeit at the same time. The other one we've got to consider as we go down through the levels, particularly down to two and then down to one, is we will be starting up domestic, more people start to do domestic travel. And people will be chomping at the bit to do international. And if they create this bubble between Australia and New Zealand, we will get people moving backwards and forwards. Ideally, avoid it. Get your workers and employees to check themselves before they travel. And if they have a cough, anything like that, get them to notify yourselves, the supervisors, and then stay at home. Okay, decisions can be made around that. You need to start thinking now about what system you're going to have in place. If somebody, let's say, goes down to Invercargo, it's part of your business, and they become sick when they're down there. How do you handle it? How do you put them up in hotels, etc.? So you need to start thinking about this now because, as I said, this virus is going to be around for a while and we're going to have to handle these type of things. And as I said, for the overseas site in particular, check with the latest guidance, recommendations for each country once the board, and particularly as we come to borders reopening. From a psychological point of view, you have got people here in New Zealand who are family overseas going through a lot worse than we are. And some of them, I, I know people in Bristol, for example. You're going to want to get people who automatically want for reassurance to travel off to see their loved ones. We're going to have New Zealanders who are overseas want to come back, reunite with the families. This is normal. It always happens after these things. People reconnect, reunite. How are you going to manage this? 
So start thinking about it. And what happens if you do send somebody overseas on a business trip, how do you manage that this melt break and they, they get stranded? One of the important things is everybody's focusing very, very much on COVID at the moment, and COVID-19. We are, some people are now overlooking the normal day-to-day -day risks in the workplace. They're getting focused on one area. It's important we look at all these things equally. As you know, most of you will have in this in place at the moment, a infectious disease preparation response plans. So it's important that you stay abreast of the guidance from places like the Minister of Health, a Chazans, the retail sector, etc. They're all putting out good information and they are talking to specialists within the field and all working together to develop these. These will constantly change as the risk changes. Think about how your workers may be exposed and it's not only at work, but how are they going to be exposed at home and the community? And this morning when I filled in some forms at the site, I had to fill in was anybody at home ill, etc. And was I aware of any community outbreaks? So important to factor that in. Uh, we do have the tick boxes I've seen for the over 70s, uh, pregnancy, etc. There are other risk factors in there, so often another other box would do. And what controls do you need to put in place to actually address the risks? Is one thing collecting this information? But what do you do when somebody says yes or phones in ill, etc.? How do you manage that? And particularly if you're a, an SME and you've only got four or five members of staff. Right, last a couple of slides. Equipment. For those of you who use monitoring equipment, and I'm not only talking occupational hygienists here, I'm talking about confined space, a entry, a brewers, a metalworks, etc., who might be doing carbon dioxide monitoring and others. Research has come through in the last week that they discovered the CO sensors in the any four five gas detectors can respond to hand sanitizers and a sort of sure reaction saying that you've got carbon monoxide. It's not, it's coming from the hand sanitizers. And we are aware that the products in a lot of the hand sanitizers can poison your sensor. So it doesn't actually see it afterwards. A, so when you wear gloves, make sure you haven't got your hand sanitizer on. It's important to keep, use soap and water, hot soap and water. If you have to clean your items before you hand it over to somebody else on another shift, then make sure you clean your gas detectors with warm water and detergent, not alcohol. If your company policy is that you will use a sanitizer, like as a proper alcohol, then switch the machine off, wipe it down, then put it either out in the sun or under a lamp so that all alcohol is evaporated before you even think about switching it back on. The other thing that what is going on at the moment is the what we call the OPCs, optical particle counters. Some people have been going out with these type of monitors. A dust track is an example. There's a CEL version as well. I to say they can monitor for the particles in the air. These things do not tell you what's there. They just monitor particles and it's got nothing to do with whether it's a virus or not a virus. So there is no proof that these items can detect and give you a real time reading if you've got it there or not. But in particular with the gas detectors, make sure you adjust the policies. Finally, this is going to be around for a long time. Uh, the boffins believe we're in phase one, phase two, the second wave we expect, and potentially a third wave. So stay up to date with the latest advice from reputable sources. 
and be prepared to update and modify your plans as things develop and we start to understand the risks around the, this subject far better. It's one more risk in the game of risk management. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Um, right, so um, if you've got questions, please fire them under the Q&A panel, you can fire them in under the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, halfway along. Um, there's been a couple of questions that have already been answered. Bridget, thank you for that. Perhaps you just want to read them out so people can um, uh, say what you said around the Clorox. Sure. Um, so one of the questions was, what are your thoughts on Clorox fog? And so I said that Clorox fogs are hypochlorite or bleach substance, um, which is an effective dis disinfectant against COVID-19. Um, fogs can be good at getting into nooks and crannies and um, can lessen the time for application compared to wiping down uh, surfaces, uh, but they do require specialist equipment. And you also need to consider the, um, the risks involved with using that type of substance, particularly around the inhalation and contact hazards. Um, so making sure you've got, like Derek said, good ventilation and you're um, you know, wearing gloves and, and, and that sort of thing, protecting your eyes because they are um, corrosive substances. Um, and then also look at the technical data sheet and look at the concentration required and the contact time for um, the scenario application that you're um, uh, want, wanting to disinfect. Great. Um, the next question was, will you consider a perspex screen on top of a desk divider as an isolation control? Uh, it's an engineering control. Um, if you're going to look at using these, the height of those um, screens is important um, because you're wanting to uh, minimise the spread of, of aerosol um, between those people. Um, but that is a control that you can consider. And one um, other thing, Bridget, on that, I guess, would be um, considering airflow around it. So if there was window close by or maybe somebody using a fan or something like that, um, it potentially is not as effective if you've got a reasonable amount of airflow around it. Great. There was one uh, question. So you go, Derek. No, you go. Uh, there was one question that came in previously around distance. Let's bring it up in a second. Um, interesting comments in the, from the panel around managing a situation where workers are not able to maintain a one metre separation. What controls do you recommend? Um, I think Derek covered that quite well. I guess it's always go back to your um, hierarchy of controls and make sure that obviously those people um, absolutely have to work closer than that one metre. Um, like Bridget was talking, screens, are you able to put screens up um, between the people? Are you able to do it a different way? Are they able to move somewhere else and do that same job in a different place? Um, but ultimately, if, if the answer or you work fully through all the um, hierarchy controls and got to where they have to work closer than one metre, I guess you do have to resort to the, um, the lowest level of control, which is PPE, um, which brings its own issues as well um, around, like Derek talk, respirators. They've obviously got to be worn. People have got to be trained. They've got to be fit tested. Um, there's, there's lots of things around that, and that goes with gloves. And um, essentially, all PPE has to be worn um, correctly, um, put on correctly, worn correctly, and removed correctly to be effective. Cool. Uh, another question um, is around disinfectants and bleach. According to the instructions, they say they should be left on surfaces for 12 minutes, or sorry, for 10 minutes to be effective. However, they may not be possible in a busy workplace. Um, and then it goes on to say, how many times should you do it during a day with you know, the busy services like doorknobs, steer rails, tap, taps, fridges, handles, those sort of things. What, what are your thoughts around length of time and how often um, things should be different, disaffected? I think it's important to look at the manufacturer's guidelines, as Derek was mentioning, and, and look to those. Um, otherwise, you can um, build up the immunity of the of the virus to that particular substance. So, um, if the substance that you're using has a contact time of 10 minutes, then maybe you need to look at using a different substance that has a a, a smaller contact, a, a, a reduced contact time. 
Um, and then also just really promoting those hygiene um, considerations as well, hand washing, hand sanitizing, et cetera. Cool. Um, here's one for Carl maybe or for, uh, um, what is the recommendation? for minimum ratio of fresh air to recirculated air in an office environment? Uh, thank you, Carl. Um, this is actually a question that we've been debating over with uh, Derek uh, over the last few days. Um, there has been uh, some studies done uh, in Wuhan, China, about, uh, for some of you that have uh, read the article about a restaurant in China that uh, where some people got uh, infected with the virus uh, and it is believed this has come from uh, the ventilation system. Uh, current studies are actually being conducted as to uh, how uh, the virus can travel through the uh, ventilation system. And at the moment, there is no uh, set guidelines of uh, air ratios or the quantity of air that uh, should be applied. Uh, there are studies being done at the University of Nebraska and also in Canada um, along this, this line. So this is basically work in progress and uh, we are keeping a close eye on that because I'm sure everyone would really be interested to know what is the ratio of, uh, let's say, in an office per square uh, uh, meterage of my office, how much air do I need to supply? Or uh, the quantity of air is in terms of volumes uh, per cubic minute or per cubic uh, second of air that I need to supply for me to be able to make sure that this virus is being uh, extracted from the environment. So, as I said, it's work in progress. We are keeping a close eye on that. Thank you. Richard, Carl, any comments? Um, just a lot of some of the papers I've read are around introduce as much fresh air as you can, the precautionary kind of approach um, to make sure you've got good air turnover um, within a building, and then also having it on uh, kind of two hours prior to people starting if it's. Uh, that type of operation and then keep it going for two hours after everybody's left the building to make sure you've got good um, air turnover within that building. Uh, just a follow-up question, what's the recommendation then for HVAC settings? Yes, unfortunately this is a way we cannot give a definitive uh, figure but at the moment, the recommendation is just increase the amount of ventilation that you can have uh, in your area if possible. But uh, as we have said, currently there is no definitive figure we're working with and we are just uh, following the research that is being done uh, internationally. Uh, I'm sure once something comes up, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> cool. So another question, sort of similar, area, someone says, there's a uh, Barry, thanks Barry, the studies I've read re Wuhan with our transmission and airflow suggest that there's airflow within the restaurant. Is there evidence to date of the virus traveling through ducted air conditioning systems? Um, I'll, I'll just give a brief, um, there's a recent article that has just come out of a Wuhan hospital, I think the article came out yesterday or the day before, that said that they've, uh, they've uh, managed to get some traces of the virus, but uh, they are uh, working out to see whether these traces are active or inactive. And there's also evidence to say that on the filter systems of some of these um, ventilation systems, they found traces of the virus. So one of their recommendations has been change the filter system uh, but once again, research is in progress. We cannot give anything definitive at the moment. But these are just recommendations that are coming at the moment. Change filtrations as, as much as possible um, and increase the ventilation. That's the general recommendations coming out from uh, all the papers that uh, we have seen so far. If I can just come in on this one. Uh, what Barry says there is perfectly right. And it is the more fresh air, the better. 
And I think on that study that was done up at the hospital, the areas they found the heaviest contamination were those like the toilets, et cetera, that were not areas that were not ventilated. So we know at the moment we understand that if it's not ventilated or well ventilated, then that's where they're finding the heavier concentrations. But as I said, this is constantly developing on us, lots of research going on all over the globe and people are sharing it. And from that, we can then develop a new policies, new guidance, etc. On oh, HVAC again, seems like a bit of a bit of a topic here, a bit of a, a bit of a good one. On the on the chat room, some Andy has uh, put in a comment. Um, some HVAC control systems are quite complex, and will chose fresh air dampeners as a matter of course in, in a heated environment. Overcoming overcoming such complexity, what which is often automatic and with no user use intervention capability, may not be easy. So it's more of a comment. If you guys can see that, any comments? Uh, yeah, I think that it, it is tricky. Um, if, there, if, if you can't manually override those kinds of things, then um, increasing ventilation, opening windows if you can, um, opening doors, just trying to um, increase your ventilation that way where you can. Yeah, talk, to, uh, talk to the installer. Yeah, you can, open, you can open windows even if you've got a, a ventilation system. It doesn't stop you opening a window. Uh, if you've got that access. But this is where your maintenance people are so, so vital because they will know the, how to override these things, etc., or how to make the adjustments to them. Yeah, and just to add on to that, uh, uh, if uh, normally with some of these complex uh, ventilation systems, you also have uh, settings that you can input and as has been suggested uh, earlier on, try and increase uh, the start time of your uh, ventilation sy system kicking in and the the time when it's actually going to shut down for for the non-active period. So we're probably, because we, we were aiming for efficiency uh, on costs and we used to start it 15 minutes or 10 minutes before official work time, now you need to increase that to probably two hours before official work time and probably another two hours after the official um, knock-off time, just to, to, to have that safety factor in. Thank you. Okay, one for Peter. Any thoughts on swab, surface swab effectiveness for cleaning, for validating cleaning? Uh, well, typically for any sort of surface swab, you need a guideline to compare the results to. Um, there's no known um, dose or you know, surface level for COVID-19 that is deemed safe. Um, also, I'm not sure if there's an analysis methodology that can, you can use a surface swab for for, um, for, for testing for COVID-19. So they're um, just using your disinfectants and you, making sure you're having a good contact time and you've got the dis a disinfectant that is suitable for COVID-19 um, is, is important. You could look at also doing um, uh, glowworm testing to see if um, the, the cleaning uh, that you're doing is, is effective. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Cool. What about hand dryers, and drink fountains, bottle filling machines, fans? It's quite a big topic, really. It is. I guess it goes, that, that one goes a little bit back to um, hierarchy of controls again. Um, do they need to be used? I guess the first one, hand dryers, potentially look at putting in, um, uh, so you use paper towels, paper towel dispensers, using those and not using hand dryers. Um, drink fountains, probably a similar thing, um, that if you've got other ways rather than using drink fountains, which are a high touch area or likely to be high touch area, um, you know, yeah, bottle fillings, much the same. Um, fans, um, I guess the question is with all of them, do they need to be used? And, and if you can do without them, um, you better take precautionary approach um, for, for any of those types of shared things. Cool. What about local exhaust ventilation? Mm, in what regard, Stefan? Bearing in mind while we are waiting to get more clarification from uh, Stefan that uh, 
if we are talking of ventilation in this current environment, we are mainly uh, focusing or the better method is the uh, negative pressure system where we actually want to extract this virus and whatever other contaminants that are in the air out of the system. Um, we I would want to believe the positive ventilation system would probably more likely spread it around before it's flushed out of the system. So I would say a negative pressure ventilation system is a better method of, uh, of trying to ventilate um, your environment. Right. Um, how effective is UV sterilization in your H A H U's? Whatever A H U's are. Air handling unit. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ms. Biska. <laughs> Mariska, you're probably a um, better place to answer that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure. I haven't um, seen any um, studies on that, so I can't comment. No, I'm much the same. I um, know it's out there, but I haven't had anything to do with UV sterilisation and, and um, air handling units. No, it's a, this research going on in this area at the moment on using UV because the thoughts are a sunlight is effective, hence they're thinking about using UV. But at the moment, there's no definitive a research that's been done that's actually confirmed how effective it is in removing or killing the virus. Cool. Oh. Um, a side question, um, what well, partly related to COVID-19, but not really. This is a, a more of a political question, perhaps. What are your thoughts on the current WES consultation by WorkSafe, will they be practical or realistic? Um, well, WorkSafe generally consider um, health um, health effect rather than um, the, the practicality of measurement, et cetera. And that's, that's because that's their role. Um, that's just what, what they need to look at. They need to see if the WES that are set are going to protect worker health. So um, for us hygienists and other people that work um, with the particular substances, that's our role to uh, look at what the practicality of, of measuring those hazards are and controlling those hazards. So I encourage you to put in a submission to WorkSafe um, outlining um, any concerns you have in that area. There's a couple of comments here. I appreciate those comments that we should actually ask Donald Trump for some commentary and advice. <laughs> since he's um, obviously an expert. Um, but we're not take that any further. Probably <laughs> NSA is not. Much cool. <laughs> um, other comments? What time are we going to time? We've got a few minutes left if anybody's got any other questions. Um, so comments? Stefan um, sent in a, another response there. So um, cleaning requirements of, of LEV. Um, some of the staff are concerned with use for welding and other manufacturing tasks. Um, so if you do use LEV for, for welding fume, that's still, um, you know, you use well, that can be a good control for, for uh, welding fume. So I wouldn't um, stop doing that because you still need to control your hazards at work. Um, for cleaning requirements, so if you have um, different welding bays that are used by multiple people, um, you can look at using um, a sanitizer uh, in between each people because sometimes breathing zones do get close to um, those types of local exhaust ventilation. Um, so, yeah, I would still encourage the, the use and, and you, you could look at having some cleaning requirements um, for, for those and in between people. Yeah, and that, that makes perfect sense. It's more the handling of it to move it into place that they're probably worried about. Normally they do have gloves on if they're welding, etc. So look at the actual process. And with that type of ventilation system, when we're looking at aerosols, a such as this COVID-19 and what we discuss, and this airborne transmission, most of these systems, if there was any around, we'd suck it up and out every day capture of it because these are quite powerful systems. But look at the actual one, if they're touching it, they've normally got their own personal gloves on for things like welding, etc. So they've really got protection. 
and they just have general hygiene, you know, and before breaks and things like that, washing hands for 20 seconds with soap and water um, before they need to, yeah, go and eat or have a cigarette or whatever. Yeah, and as somebody there, a field came through on a most of our a local exhaust ventilation systems, etc., should have filters in the system as well. So again, just look at your processes and a, how you deal with it. And for those who work with the woodworking industry, where they've got really big, powerful systems, they've often got inspection panels and things like this inside there. A, so how are you going to maintain it? How are you going to be maintain these people? going to keep this equipment because they will be the ones handling it, touching it, etc. So just have another look at your procedures and your policies and what you do normally day to day should cover you around this. Oh, we've got another question. Um, fit testing, hood or port account? Interested in your views on these processes? Um, so uh, qualitative can still be used in these current climates. I have heard some people not wanting to use qualitative, but um, you can, you know, you need to clean in between each um, each person um, to make sure that um, the, the you know, it's clean and there's no, no um, you, you're not limiting that risk of transmission if people um, are, un, are asymptomatic, I guess. Um, and again, checking, like not fit testing anyone that has got symptoms of, of being um, unwell. And so asking those questions before you undertake fit testing. Um, qualitative um, has its limitations in, in just relation to a method, um, but it is still a, um, a, a good uh, tool for, for determining fit testing. There's not many port accounts in New Zealand, so there's more qualitative hoods, so that's more accessible for a lot of people at the moment too. Thanks. Um, so one question from David yeah. around safety of hoods. I'm not quite sure what the question was, but... Yeah, it's probably in relation to qualitative um, fit testing where they use the hood um, to place over the, the subject and the, the test um, person. And yeah, again, cleaning um, PPE uh, requirements uh, for the tester because they do have to get close to that person, so gloves, etc. Um, is, is an important consideration when you're doing fit testing uh, at the moment. Any, anybody doing fit testing in the current environment probably should have a fairly good document around, um, have done that over the last few weeks, I would expect, and, and have that all documented. So I guess if it's an external person doing it, um, make sure you ask for that, um, how, what they're doing to control that risk. What about sanitation of those hoods, Juan um, from David? Uh, we've been using um, high strength alcohol wipes to clean clean those and they work uh, they work well they're easy easy to use um, and they're they'll probably end up um, limit uh, reducing the life of the of the hoods I would suspect over time but um, they they work absolutely fine cool question come here from the chat um, from the chat um, this is a quite interesting one does the panel believe that New Zealand readily and properly understands that using a mask properly the it, 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 it takes the removal of beards, never mind a couple of days' growth? We're a beardy nation. <laughs> we sure I'm, are a beardy nation, and it can be very contentious to ask someone to shave their beard for a fit test. Um, but it is, it is very important that people are clean shaven when they're wearing respirators, or they just won't get a good seal. Um, even even with um, you know a, a day of growth, you can still get gaps in that uh, in that seal, which can let in um, uh, the substance you're trying to keep out. So uh, having the conversation with with your team um, is really important, um, preferably at the outset of their employment, so they know what is um, what is expected. And if they um, if they just don't want to shave, then you'll have to consider other options. Um, maybe a positive pressure respirator, or maybe they do a different um, task that doesn't require them to wear a respirator. And remember, this applies to the men and women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay there, Derek. Um, 
Yeah. All right, so just about out of time. I think that's probably any final comments on the panelists before we wrap up? Just one for myself. Uh, I think the others probably agree, or they might disagree. Uh, it's very important that you stay up to date and you with what's going on, so stay in touch with groups like Hazans, with the NZOHS, Nurses Association, the MOH, government websites, and people like Chazans and all these, based on your industry. Because the information will be updated on a regular basis as we learn more, we understand more. And that's the best way we can get information out to everybody. And kind of, I guess the last thing, only get information from those sources. There's a huge amount of information out there. Everybody kind of has an opinion on it, but getting it from those good sources like um, like the ones that Derek just mentioned is critical. Yeah, and, and just another comment regarding um, uh, use of uh, respirators. Training of, of the wearers is just critical. How to don and off, put on, take off the respirator is, um, really really important uh, for um, control of, 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 in, of infection um, so and just how those respirators are looked after and cared for as well maintained so training 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 and you can add that gloves to that list yeah 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 there is a, a a right way to take off your gloves um so um just to to, to so you're not touching your skin um while, while you're doing that so that's great. Thanks, panellists. Um, thank you for your time and thanks for coming along to this webinar. Um, so the recording of the session and the presentation will be available on the Hazard Insight, the COVID-19 um, tab shortly, uh, probably tomorrow, what time we get um, it loaded up. Um, and you'll see other resources there and other um, webinar information from previous webinars. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, panellists. And thank you for the New Zealand Occupational Hygiene Society for co-hosting this with us. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Uh, any other thoughts on um, webinar topics? Uh, flick it to me at philipaldridge at hazans.co. Uh, philipaldridge at hazans.org.nz. Get it right. Um, mm -hmm. Or flick me an email or give me a call. So um, we're happy to provide more webinars on various topics. So uh, thanks for your time today. Thank you, panelists. Uh, have a good day. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.